remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them and we try to respond to all. So today we're going to deal with Mr. Prince again, Joseph Prince. There's a short video from YouTube called Grace Leads to True Repentance. And we'll get to this in a moment. But what I want to talk about is the sacrifice of Christ and what it accomplished for us. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to dig into the scriptures a little bit. Let me pull that up and we'll get going. So you'll notice that I do come back to this verse quite often and because it is a pivotal verse for theology. And that is 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So here's the rooted word translation of this passage. And uh, let me just find verse 7 here. In case that we may be walking about in the rays of shining, in the way that he is in the rays of shining, we are holding commonality with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is purging us off from every lack of allotment. It's not purging sin from us. It's purging us off from sin. It's very important. And this is the critical difference between those who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and those who preach this other gospel. They call it the gospel of grace, but it's not the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of apostasy against Jesus Christ. It says right here by John, the beloved Apostle, the beloved disciple, who's speaking the testimony of God about Jesus Christ, whom he knew better than any of the disciples did. And he says, And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is purging us off from every lack of allotment. That's sin, lack of allotment. His blood is purging us off from every lack of allotment. Okay? So that's the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the atonement for our sin, which is what we see a few verses later. Let's have a look at that. So here it is. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My infants, I am writing this to you in order that you may not be without allotment. And if anyone may be without allotment, we are having the one calling alongside before the Father, equitable Jesus Christ. And he is atonement about our lack of allotment, but not merely about those of ours, but also about the whole collection of individuals. So let's focus on this. He's the atonement for our sins, the atonement for our lack of allotments. He's the atonement. What was the atonement for? It was to purify. It was to purify a place or a thing so that God would not leave it, so his presence would not vacate. And it's the same even now with Jesus Christ and us. He is the atonement for our sins to purify us from off of the sins. To purify us from off of the sins, which ties in with the Job 28, 28 that we read in the previous video. But to hold off from the worthless ones, it is a superimposed standing. Okay, let me pull that down a little bit so you can read it because I'm sure those uh, icons are gonna cover it a bit. Job 28, 28. But he says to a human being, stare at carefully to do. The reverence of God is being wisdom. But to hold off from the worthless ones, it is a superimposed standing. Like understanding, like knowledge that's been superimposed on you. If you want that, that standing to be superimposed on you, this standing, this knowledge, then you must hold off from the worthless ones, okay? 
you'll see it translated evil, but there are different kinds of evil. And this kind of evil is worthless evil, but it's about individuals, actually. So when we go back here and we look at this, it says, and he is the atonement about our lack of allotment. Okay, he is atoning us, right, from off of. Remember we saw that uh, back up. Let me get back to my program. I'm trying to, try to scroll your screen. All right, so it says here, is purging us off from every lack of allotment. Okay. So now we understand what Jesus did. He purged us off from sin. He doesn't purge sin from us. He purges us, us off from sin. He, through his power of his Holy Spirit, gets us to hold off from the worthless ones, the things that lead to a lack of allotment, things that are truly sinful, The difference is that Christ is trying to get us to leave sin. To stop sin, leave sin. He's not taking sin from us. He's not wiping sin away so that any sin that we commit in the future is not really sin. That's not what he's doing. And that's what these preachers are making it look like. Let's get right in here to Joseph Prince so we can get on with it and you can hear what he has to say and we can deal with it. Now that you've got that under your belt, you know that difference about atonement. Let's deal with what Prince has to say. So the topic I want to share today is repentance. Say repentance. repentance. Now I can preach it like this, okay? Repent! Okay. So he's mocking. He's mocking preachers who are serious about repentance. Absolutely. He's mocking people who are serious about repentance, who are calling people to repent and trying to give them the power to repent, imparting this power through the power of their voice. He's mocking that. He's mocking all the preachers that ever came before him because they all preached that, that way about repentance. He's mocking the servants of God. He's mockering, mocking the ministers of Jesus Christ. Listen to him. He's very crafty. Okay, listen. I can tell you, change your mind. All right, you used to think this way. Now think this way because the word repentance is so abused today that people say things like, all right, Oh, let's hold off before he gets into this next part. He has said this cliche that you hear modern preacher after modern preachers say, which is a lie about the word, metanoia. He says it means change your mind. It doesn't. Noia comes from the word mind, but meta does not mean to change. It means in the midst of, and noia actually, literally in this case, means to exercise one's thinking. So metanoia, the word translated repent, is to change, uh, is to um, exercise one's mind in the midst of, in the midst of what? Whatever circumstances you're in, the occasion. Exercise the mind for what? Well, what do you think it would be for? To do what's right and to not do what's wrong, to not sin and to do what's right that you are required to exercise your mind to take control of every thought and submit it to Christ, as Paul said. It's one of the weapons of our warfare, and he's mocking it. And he says that it means to change your mind. So, all right, let's say that I've changed my mind, and I'm in agreement with God, and then if I'm going to continue to live in metanoia, that means I have to change my mind again away from God to disagree with him, and to change again to something else and to something else. And you see what's happening. You're becoming a planet in the Greek sense of the word. It means one who roams, a false teacher. You're roaming, you're changing, you're unstable. 
do not like the stars that mark their course out season after season, and you can navigate your way home by those stars. But they were trained to ignore the planets because they were called planetai, wanderers, roamers. And if you followed them, you would also end up being lost and never find your way home. They would mislead you off into a course somewhere down the road and you won't know where you are. Even if you did then try to use the stars to find your way home, you couldn't because you'd have no idea where you were. And you couldn't backtrack because you used the planets to get there and the planets aren't marking out the same course all the time. You can't just backtrack. Planets are different every night and they even go through retrograde motion where they're going one way and then they go back and they go back again like that. So, and that's what he's talking about doing. That's what these preachers are saying when they say metanoia means to change your mind. Of course, they'll never outright say that, but that is what is being, you're being led to do, actually. Because they're always after some new twist, another new twist, another new twist. They're not out for stability and to properly preach the testimony of God. And neither is, is Joseph Prince. He is not out for that. He's out for fame. He's out to look smart. He's an engineer. He's an IT engineer. So for him, the epitome of everything is to be smarter than everyone else. And they think they are. They may never tell you to your face, but they will treat you that way. And you can hear this. Let's go ahead and listen to more of what he has to say. Well, so-and-so doesn't preach repentance. Well, that preacher, you know, he doesn't preach repentance as if they are an authority on repentance. Okay, so here he, he slams someone for something that they, they, never, they never claimed to be, as if anyone ever claimed to be an authority on repentance. But maybe they are. Maybe they actually have repented. Maybe they actually have stopped sinning. And Joseph Prince certainly hasn't, because he even admits such. So that's someone who refuses to repent, slandering someone who has repented, saying they pretend to be an authority on repentance, but no one is because of their own failure to repent. They then change their teaching to support their own behavior, to teach people you don't have to repent or repentance is something other than what it is literally in the Greek. So that's the games he's playing. This preacher doesn't preach repentance. They have every right to say that. This preacher doesn't preach repentance. That's a valid accusation. And he's clearly saying it because people are accusing him of that. And that is why he's actually teaching this today. To try to clear the air of it, but he doesn't. In fact, he clarifies that their complaint is 100% accurate. It's true. Let's listen to more. And at the top, well, so-and-so doesn't preach repentance. Because the word repentance is so abused today that people say things like, all right, well, so-and-so doesn't preach repentance. That's abusing the word repentance? He says it's so abused today that people will say such things like, well, that preacher doesn't preach repentance. That's not abuse of the word. That's a valid complaint. If a preacher doesn't preach repentance, it's valid to say he doesn't preach repentance. How can that be an abuse of the word repentance? It's not an abuse of the word. He is a liar. He is a liar. And I hope, Mr. Prince, that you're watching my video. Although I don't expect that you are. Who am I after words? I mean, you wouldn't pay attention to me at all. I'm nobody. But if you happen to run across my video at any point in the future, I hope I'm looking you in the eyes and calling you a liar. Your father is not the father in heaven of Jesus Christ because you are a liar. And you're doing it on purpose. You are doing it on purpose. I don't think you fear God. I don't think you even believe God exists. Because you behave as if you can say anything and get away with anything, as if God is not going to 
punish you. But then again, your theology says that he's not going to, that he can't. You sit above God and tell him what he can and cannot do. Let's listen to more. Well, that preacher, you know, he doesn't preach repentance as if they are an authority on repentance. And, and I just want to question their idea of repentance. What do they mean when they say repentance? All right. When they say repentance, many of them are referring to you got to be sin conscious. You got you to beat yourself over your sins. You gotta... OK, what's the problem with that, Mr. Prince? Of being conscious of your sins. If you're not conscious of your sins, then you do not revere God or revere his law or revere his judgment or revere his wrath or revere Jesus Christ's sacrifice for sin, his resurrection from the dead to free us from the bondage of sin so that we can obey. And how can you obey if you are not conscious of sin? If you're not aware of when you're sinning or not, how can you obey? How can you correct yourself? How can you hear God's correction if you're not aware of sin? And if you are aware of sin and you do not beat your chest and mourn, then you are not a Christian. He is revealing right now that he is not a Christian. This is convenient for him to make money, to get popularity and use it to leverage for business. I saw a video where he talked about starting a college, showed this fancy, fancy, unbelievable futuristic architecture. And he's going to rent out all the stuff below it for entertainment and, and events and things like this to make money from the world. He says, we should get money from the world and take their money. That's how he talked. Let's go ahead and look at where it says in the New Testament that we must weep, mourn, and wail, change our laughter to gloom. Let's look at that. That's in one of my favorite books, the book of Jacob. Here we go, chapter 4, starting in verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? I'm just reading from the King James. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Move this to my other screen here. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Mr. Prince, listen clearly. Unstop your ears and hear the words of the gospel. Ye adulterers, you adulterer, don't you know that friendship with the whole collection of individuals is to be an enemy of God? Popularity of the masses is enmity with God. Not friendship with God, enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the whole collection of individuals, the masses, is the enemy of God. Joseph, you want to be the enemy of God. Clearly you do. You have no authority to talk about repentance, salvation, or anything scriptural, anything about Christ or God or anything spiritual. And here it is, verse 5, Do ye think that the scripture says in vain, in emptiness, without power, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? But he giveth more grace, Here's your word that you love is grace. You love this word because you love to pervert it and distort it because it's so easy to. Because people don't know what grace really is. They think it's like being given something for free. Like being given something that we don't 
we don't deserve, right? It's cheerful graciousness. That's what it literally is. It's all about being cheerful. But he gives more cheerful graciousness. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. Hear me clearly, Joseph. God resists the proud. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You may think you have grace. You do not have grace because you are not humble. And if you say, well, I'm humble. I just don't believe in beating my chest over sin. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> God resisteth the proud. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. So because of that, submit yourself to God. Put yourself under God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He hasn't fled from you yet, Joseph. He's got a hold of you with his talons in your neck. Resist the devil, and he will free, flee from you. Draw nigh to God. Draw up alongside, close, that's what it means. Draw up alongside, close to God, and he will draw up alongside, close to you. And here's where the beating of the chest comes in. And this is a command to us to do in humility. This is the humility part. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. It's not just looking at your ledger and remembering what Christ, you know, paid for you. No. This says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, to Christians. And purify your hearts, you double-minded, to Christians. The Christian who would govern his own life is a double-souled person. And this word means also double-souled, not double-minded. It's double-minded, double-hearted, and double-willed. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. That sounds a lot like beating your chest, doesn't it? Over your sin, you sinners. You sinners. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be, let is very soft. It means turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. In case you forgot that this is all about humility, how you do humility. He says it again in case you forgot the connection with it at the beginning. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Joseph, you're wrong. Joseph, you are in error. Joseph, you are teaching false teachings and misleading the terrifyingly clean ones of God and the infants in Christ. You are doing wicked things, Joseph. Stop it. Stop it. In the name of Jesus, stop it but I don't think you will. Let's go on with what else he has to say. Sin conscious, none. Nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the gospel. You gotta, you gotta beat yourself over your sins. You gotta be sin conscious. He's not sin telling you to beat repentance. yourself. All right? When they say repentance, many of them are referring to you gotta be sin conscious. You gotta, you gotta beat yourself over your sins. You gotta be sin conscious. Now, nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the gospel. Right there. He says, nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the gospel. And I just read you from the book of Jacob, aka James, who's the brother of Jesus Christ and the head of the church at Jerusalem, which is the whole church. This is the gospel. The gospel is not only in the gospel accounts of Jesus Christ and what he preached. 
The gospel is also what was preached by Peter and James and John and Paul, the author of Hebrews. Yes. Let's keep listening and see what else he says in error. The gospel says because of what Christ has done, we should have no more sin consciousness. It doesn't say that anywhere. Anywhere in the entire Bible does it say that. And that's the problem, is that people are not listening closely. They're not scrutinizing what they're hearing. Let's listen to that again so we catch it exactly what he said and correct it. Because of what Christ has done, we... The gospel says because of what Christ has done, all sin con we should have no more sin consciousness. Yes. Okay? We should have no more sin consciousness. Consciousness means being aware of it. Because of what Christ has done, we're to no longer identify sin or be abhorrent about sin or treat it as if it were abhorrent. Yeah? That's what he's saying. Listen to it again. Now, nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the gospel. The gospel says because of what Christ has done, we should have no more sin consciousness. That is not what the gospel says at all at all. When Jesus said to the man he healed, he says, stop sinning or something worse may happen. Does that sound like he's telling him, uh, don't worry about it, just don't think about sin? No. And Joseph will say, well, that's before Jesus died and raised from the dead. Well, let's go back to that story that I keep coming back to recently, Ananias and Sapphira. The Holy Spirit killed them because of their sin. Now, if what he said is true, the Holy Spirit would have spoken through Peter and said, it wasn't sin. Because to not be sin conscious means that when someone sins, you call it something different. Otherwise, you're conscious of sin, even in other people even in other believers, even when you are the pastor and you're holding them accountable and they sin and they know that you saw, you know that they sinned and you say to them, that wasn't sin. Don't worry. There is no sin anymore. That's to be without sin consciousness. And that is what he's saying. But let's listen to more of what he has to say. We saw that last week, didn't we? In Hebrews 10. We saw that... This is where he makes a mistake in applying uh, Greek grammar to theology. It's very sick. A believer once cleansed. And the word once cleansed in the Greek is the perfect tense. Never to be repeated act. He says that a verb in the perfect tense is an act that is never to be repeated again. It's a lie. It's an absolute lie. If I say, um, I finished going to the bathroom, that doesn't mean I'm never going to go to the bathroom again. <laughs> of course I'm going to go to the bathroom again. Idiot. He is. I don't think he's an idiot. I don't think he's actually like unaware of that. I think he's doing it on purpose because he knows that most of the people listening to him have no idea about Greek grammar. The perfect tense is the same as in the English. It's something that's completed, but it doesn't mean it won't happen again. It has nothing to do with that. It doesn't say anything about whether it's going to be repeated again, ever again. It only says that it is an action that was completed as opposed to still being done. For example, um, Johnny, did you complete your homework? Yes, I did my homework. Yeah. Or we can ask it a different way because there is the perfect and the imperfect. The imperfect is something that was still going on. Johnny, when you went out to play, had you done your homework already? No, I was doing my homework and then I went out to play. 
And then I did it again when I was, I finished it when I came back in. So his homework was being done while he went out to play. Okay. Or you can even say, you know, did you drink, did you drink your Kool-Aid after your homework was done? And he would say, no, while my homework was being done. That's imperfect. It's not finished when that other action happens, right? And so this is what we're dealing with. That's what the Greek grammar is discussing. When it says perfect or imperfect, it's dealing with whether the action was completed or whether it was not completed and it's still in process or was still in process while something else happened. So it's in reference to something, either now or some other event for, for imperfect. And perfect also the same thing. It was completed. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be done again. It has nothing to say about that. And this is where he is making a mistake. And I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's on purpose. I think it's a deception. Because there's no grammar in the world, no grammar book in the world that would teach you that. None. There's not a grammar book in the world that would teach you that. So it's something that he made up in order to justify his theology and trick people. And that is main, that's his main thing, is to trick people. Let's listen. All right, the effects last forever. Once you are cleansed, perfect tense, you should have no more sin consciousness or conscience of sin. The cleansing is not to cleanse us of our, to get rid of our consciousness of sin. Now, maybe there's a language barrier. You know, I hadn't thought of that at the beginning, but I just thought of that, that perhaps there's a language barrier about how he's saying this. Maybe he doesn't really mean sin consciousness, but he speaks in English so often and actually really high level, not perfect, but really high level that I don't think so. I don't think it's a language issue. Okay. The cleansing is not cleansing us like getting rid of our ability to sense sin because that's how he's using it like to eradicate our sensibilities of sin. That is not what the cleansing was for. The cleansing is as in the Old Testament, the cleansing of impurity, the cleansing of impurity. It's not the cleansing of awareness and consciousness. It's the cleansing of the impurity because this impurity is a quality. And today, Sometimes, even like in American culture, we treat impurity like it's something godly and holy and precious, you know, like a badge of honor to wear. Yeah, you know, I'm not perfect. I mean, I don't clean my room every day. That's acting like it's some sort of badge of honor, the fact that he doesn't clean his room every day, right? It's an impurity, all right? So impurity is, is something that drives God away. It drives God away. So even if we clean it up, right, there has to be some sort of purging of that impurity. Even if we clean it up in the physical world, right, since there's been some sort of sin, some sort of spiritual impurity there, it has to be purged. It has to be cleansed of that impurity for God's presence to reside. And if it isn't, God's presence doesn't reside. And we just saw that in the passage for, um, oh, I still have it there, don't I? I haven't switched over. Right here, we still see that right here in Jacob 4, right? Where it's talking about, uh, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Why does he say that? Because if you don't cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, God's presence cannot reside there in your actions and in your heart, the seat of your thoughts, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God cannot reside there if it's not purified. That's what that's all about. That's what the Bible talks about. That's what it talks about from cover to cover. That's atonement. Preaching, preaching a repentance in the area of imparting consciousness of sins is nothing more than than dishonoring the work of Jesus. Really? <laughs> so he's saying that Jesus doesn't want us to be conscious of sin. Because he says, preaching and imparting 
consciousness of sin is dishonoring the work of Jesus. He thinks that Jesus died to take away our consciousness of sin. Really, is that why Jesus died? Or was it that he died to free us from the power the sin had over our behavior and therefore over our guilt? Dear children, do not be deceived. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. So if you have to do what is right in order to be righteous, what he says is the work of Jesus is a lie. Jesus didn't come to take away our consciousness of sin. In fact, what does John have to say about those who sin? And he's, he says sin is actually doing something. Let's have a look at this to clear this. Okay, so let's have a look here at what the Bible says. It says right here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Okay, that's just technically saying what sin is in regards to the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now, the way he would interpret that is that in him there is no longer any consciousness of sin, and nothing counts as sin, which is not the gospel. Because this is written to Christians, not to non-believers. This is John writing to Christians. He says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. He already said that sin is something that is committed, that is done. Okay, let's keep going. Because it says, Who, whoever abides in him, lives in him, does not sin. Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him, no matter what he calls himself. So if you're a Christian in the way that you say, Mr. Prince, if you're a Christian in that sense, then even if you commit an act that transgresses the law, it is not sin. And yet John himself made a definition of sin right there. Whoever. It doesn't exclude Christians. It says whoever commits sin transgresses also the law for sin is the transgression of law. Whoever transgresses law has sinned. Whoever abides in him doesn't sin. Verse 6. Whoever sins has not seen him nor known him. Little children, let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Not he who believes in Jesus, even if he sins, is righteous. That's what he's saying. He who believes in Jesus, even though he sins, is righteous. This is the gospel of the apostate church, and that is not the gospel of the apostles or of Jesus Christ. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, from the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Not change them so that we don't call it what it is. That's a deception. God is not a fool. And Joseph, I know that you know God's not a fool. And I know that you are aware of God. And yet you're concealing him from people. 
which tells me what's going to happen next based on the pattern of Romans 1, if it hasn't already happened behind the scenes. And since you're at TBN, most likely it has. Whether it's a homosexual relationship or whether it's uh, fornication and adultery against your wife, or any number of other things, embezzlement, who knows what. But with TBN, it's full of wickedness. And you are in their family. You've embraced them, knowing that. Everyone knows that. So it's just waiting for it to become public. And even if it doesn't, God is not a fool. He sees you. And if you continue to conceal the glory of God, the knowledge of God, then we know what happens because of Romans 1. So stop it. Sin is of the devil. It says right here, he who commits sin is of the devil. He who does sin is of the devil. If you're a Christian and you sin, you're of the devil. You're not of Christ. You're not in Christ. Because Romans 8, 1 says what it means to be in Christ. To not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To stop sinning and doing what is right. Don't live after the flesh and its lusts anymore. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Destroy the works of the devil. Destroy the acts of sin. Not redefine them, not obliterate your awareness of them, destroy them, the acts of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. It's not redefining sin. He cannot sin, it's an action. In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever, that means Christian or not, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. There's no other way to slice it. If you sin, you're not of God. And you've already said that there's positional righteousness, doesn't matter what you do in your state, even if you want to murder someone, which means you are not of God. You are not of God. You are teaching people it's okay to sin. And now you're saying, no, no, I'm not teaching that. But you turn around and you teach it. Right? <laughs> when saying that you're accused of, of teaching it, you turn around and teach it. Let's hear what else he has to say. I paid my debt. A I huge know debt. About the debt. All right? And I, and, and I hear the news, the good news, that he paid my debt. Okay? He's a man of integrity. And I hear the, the news. And I laugh it off. And I say, I don't believe it. Though it's still paid, I have dishonored that man. Are you listening? Moreover, not only have I dishonored the man, whenever I meet my creditor, I will have, what, debt on my conscience, even though it's paid. So he thinks that when Christ died for the sins of the world, that the debt was paid for everyone. And if the debt was paid for everyone, that means everyone's forgiven of their sins. That's universalism. That's where they believe that no one will be guilty of sin. It's a heresy. It's been a heresy for 2,000 years. To say that the debt was paid for everyone before they even accepted the offer and the calling of God, that it was paid for everyone, is a, it's a heresy. It's saying that because if the debt was paid, then that means it can't be held against them which means the wrath of God cannot be held against anyone since Christ died for the sins of the world. And we know he died for the sins of the world, but what does that mean? He's saying it means that their debts were paid. 
and that his debts were paid, all of them, in full, which means he doesn't have to repent, which means that everyone will be saved, and no one will suffer the wrath of God, Christian or non-Christian, for anything. This is heresy, and this is where he's going with this. So you can see that, that Joseph Prince is very crafty, and he's trying to use everything he can to deceive the listener. Let's hear just a little bit more of his trickery. Mankind, you know. Well, the therefore doesn't matter because his presupposition is false. The sinner, for example, all right, always has these bad and hard thoughts about God. Hard thoughts. Thoughts are not based on facts because God loves sinful men. Another mistake he makes. God does not love sinful men. Proverbs 6. I'll pull that up for you. We'll read that in the King James. Proverbs 6.16. 6, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now notice... First one is about the eyes, a proud look. That's the body part, okay? Second one is a lying tongue. That's the body part. Next one is hands that shed innocent blood. God hates that look. God hates that tongue. God hates those hands, not the action. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. God hates a lying tongue, not the lying, but the tongue. God hates the look. God hates the feet. Oh, the heart that devises wicked imaginations. He hates the heart. The heart. He hates the feet that be swift in running to mischief. And then the last two are actual people he hates. A false witness. He hates a false witness. Not the speaking of lies itself, but the false witness. And he that soweth discord among brethren, he hates the person. He hates the person who sows discord among brethren. He hates the person, not the discord, the person. Yes, because of the discord, but the discord is nothing. The discord is an action. It's not a person. It's not something to be hated. It's an action. It's ambiguous. It's, it's intangible. God hates tangible things that are part of people and that are the people. It says he hates them. He even says that, that seven are an abomination to him. All seven are abominations to him, which is worse than hate. So, clearly here, Joseph, you don't know your Bible because you're making claims that contradict the scriptures. So let's go back a little bit and hear that again. Let's have these bad and hard thoughts about God. Hard thoughts. Thoughts are not based on facts because God loves sinful men. God does not love sinful men. We just saw in Proverbs 6, he does not love sinful men. In fact, he hates them and finds them even abominable. This man in his sinful, guilty, lost condition. No, he doesn't. He doesn't love them in their sinful, guilty, lost condition. He doesn't. God sent his son while man was still lost, while man was still sinful. Christ died when... That doesn't mean that he loved them while they were sinful. It doesn't. And was still cursing, blaspheming him, putting him on the cross. And God used the cross that wicked hands delivered him to, all right, to be an instrument of salvation and redemption for all men. Yes, he was an instrument of salvation and redemption for all men. 
but it doesn't mean that he ha- that he loved sinful men. Absolutely not. He showed mercy on them, but if he loved them, then there was no reason for mercy, because mercy is a contradiction to what's deserved. And if God loved them, then they didn't deserve any punishment. Because God's the one who sets the tone for justice. And if God loved them already, there was no need to have an atonement for their sins. God did not love sinful man. It says, for God so loved the world, which is the whole collection of individuals, okay, that he gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice in order to make peace, which implies that there was not peace between God and man. And without peace, there is no love because there's enmity between the two. So it's a lie. He doesn't understand the mechanics of what he's talking about because he doesn't understand the scriptures. He doesn't take enough time to understand it. He just plows right over everything that's sacred and has no reverence towards it. He's got most of the parts, the components, correct, right? Uh, for example, this part here where he says this, Guilty, lost condition. Hold on, right here. God sent his son right while man was still lost, while man was still sinful. Christ yes. died right. when man was still cursing, blaspheming him, putting him on the cross. And God used the cross that right. wicked hands delivered him to, all right, to be an instrument of salvation and redemption for all men. To be an instrument of salvation and redemption for all men. Yes, to be an instrument for it. Right? And so he's correct about that. But he doesn't follow that through on his theology. See, he knows that from having read the scriptures. But he has hidden the real truth of God from himself and from those who listen. Because if Christ were an instrument of salvation and redemption for all men, then that would mean that all men are not instantly saved which is what he, what he has said, the conclusion of that is that they are. If your sin has been paid for when Christ died on the cross, then that means that you're, it's paid for. You don't have to ask for forgiveness. You do not have to repent. There's no need for it because it's paid for. There's no need to accept it in order for it to be activated. There's no need for it. If the way he speaks of it, it's been paid. And I go, wow, you know, I can't believe it. It's been paid. No, really? You know, and he has no part of whether it's being paid or not. So that metaphor falls apart completely when talking about the actual sacrifice of Christ and the redemption, the salvation from his sacrifice on the cross. That metaphor does not work. That's one of the um, metaphors from the Reformation, and it falls flat on his face. Right here, he just spoke correct. It's one of the few times that he has spoken correctly. Spinning him, putting him on the cross. And God used the cross right that wicked hands delivered him to, all right, to be an instrument of salvation and redemption for all men. He's right in that one phrase. So Joseph snaps to you for that. You got that right. All the rest is wrong, but you got that right. Okay. I wish you would apply that to the rest of your mistakes, errors, and heresies and correct those. Let's keep going. We'll never understand the love of God. Which one came first? Was it Peter wept? Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. You know the story. The Bible says that Jesus was bound in, uh, in Caiaphas' house and Peter was outside. When a few people recognized Peter as one of Jesus' disciples, he denied knowing Jesus. And the Bible says with cursing and swearing. And the Bible says just before the, the, the cock crew, all right, at the third denial, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Just right after Peter denied the third time. Okay, Peter went out crying. 
Now, which one came first? Was it because Peter cried, the Lord turned and looked at him? No, it's the reverse. After he denied knowing Jesus, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. So here's an example where he's trying to make a mountain out of a molehill, right? He's trying to make something huge out of something that is not huge. It's not unimportant, but it's not huge. And he's trying to make it that way. Like, aha, I found an answer that no one saw. You didn't see this coming, right? I've got the answer. Yeah, which was it? The chicken or the egg, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's how he kind of sounds like when he introduces it, right? But then he's like, you know, well, you, you thought that, you know, because Peter cried, Christ looked at him, you know, but no, 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 you know, that, that, what, that when Jesus looked at him, Peter cried. And anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not significant. It's not important. Whether Peter cried and Christ looked at him or Christ looked at him and Peter cried, it's not important. What is important is that you have two men who betrayed Jesus and two men who were remorseful but only one of them that was repentant. And I'm talking about Peter and Judas. Peter and Judas both betrayed Christ. Peter and Judas both were remorseful. Judas was remorseful. But the outcome was different because of the repentant heart of Peter. Judas's heart could not find the way to repentance. And so, well, he either hanged himself or he fell and split his, his internals open. But Peter, he repented. He repented and was forgiven. So I think that's enough here for today. And you can see that every once in a while, he'll say something that is correct. But it's so muddy, muddy down by all of this error and heresy and, and pride and bragging and, and prancing about trying to make his intellect seem smart and witty. That's not the purpose of preaching. That's not the purpose of preaching. The purpose of preaching is to bring peace between man and God. The purpose of preaching is to bring people to repentance so that they stop sinning and start doing what's right, so that they will not suffer the wrath of God in the end, and they might pass the judgment into eternal life. It is not going to be easy. But God makes it possible for every, every human being. He makes it possible for every human being. And it's going to look different for each human being of how much is required of him. And that's where the, the parable of the talents shows up, where he gives one man ten, one five, and one one. Because he realizes they're different abilities. And he doesn't expect as much out of each one. He expects the most out of the one he gave the most to. Because he gave the most to him because he could handle the most. And then the one with five, he gave five to because that's how much they could handle and he expects that much out of them. And one, the same thing. Okay? So when we're talking about stopping sin, that is absolute. That's the same for everyone. When we're talking about what's doing what's right, that's doing what the Father tells you to do, and that's going to be different for each individual. But stopping sin is going to be the same for everyone. It'll be a different sin that plagues you from person to person, but it's still the same, stopping all sin. But doing righteousness are the righteous deeds that God has custom fitted you for so that you walk about in them. That's Ephesians 2.10. So, yes, it will look different, but it'll look the same. It'll look the same in that we stop sin altogether. But it'll look different in that we have different marching orders and we're custom fitted to different good works, good actions. And those are real, and those are tangible, and those are necessary. And our awareness of sin, our conscience that pangs us when we sin, is irreplaceable. And if it's true that he doesn't feel those pangs of conscience, 
then he has shipwrecked his faith. He has seared his conscience. And he's teaching people that searing your conscience is what Christ does to you. That was Christ's work on the cross, was to sear your conscience, and yet Paul condemns that. Those are the believers who have shipwrecked their faith. Stay in the word of the testimony of God. Keep straight following the stars. Don't follow planets like Joseph Prince. And Joseph, if you're listening to me, I pray that you'll be released from these heresies, that you'll find your way back to Christ if you ever knew him, and that you'll start preaching the true gospel that Jesus literally preaches in the Bible. Throw out all this garbage. Throw out all of this muddiness, all of this wittiness. Get rid of it. If you're serious about salvation, your salvation, I'm talking about your salvation, Joseph. If you're serious about your salvation, then you'll be like the rich young ruler. Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. I'm saying, go and get rid of all of this doctrine and garbage that you've come up with, that you've heard all of it, and come naked and poor at the feet of Jesus Christ. And let him teach you. Let him teach you as if you were a babe in Christ again. And for those of you who are on the narrow path, the high road with me to eternal life, may the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart. Remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them, and we try to respond to all. Get on over to our website, The Rooted Word, and start reading the translation and also the articles we've posted. It's at therootedword.com, therootedword.com. And may the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.